Hey, what's up? This your boy, Big Man. You know what it is, man. So let's continue with this Rough Riders Chronicles. And we're going to talk about episode five now. In episode five, we pretty much start off where we left off, where D Dean has gone to the hospital because he got injured in a tragic motorcycle accident. They say he was actually on a T-Rex, but it's, it's all the same, man. So it's looking all bad, man. And also, things are starting to change at the label with D not there, man. D is kind of like that dude who is a coach slash homeboy slash CEO who can really just coach these artists through these releases, get them in the studio, make sure that they all doing their thing and keep that continuity within the team, man. He's like the team captain, man, is the best way to say it. And it's crazy because he's out of the picture for such a long time. He said it took him years to recover. Years. And you can kind of see that. I guess they had a trait too because it's you can see his his throat where they have the hole man it was just you know it was all bad man all bad man and man much prayers to this dude i'm glad he made it through that recovery because that is a horrible situation a horrible accident man for somebody to have to go through that's for real now with darren dean out of the picture man eve seemed like the person that took it the worst man so she just goes on presses for it and creates an album she drops it called evolution and I'm going to keep it funky with y'all, man. This album just wasn't it for me. I ain't even check it out, really, man. I just, it just even though I love Rough Riders, I was a Rough Riders fan, it just, you could you could see the demise of things, man. And you we're going to get to that later. And it seemed like Eve, she just wanted to be more in the Hollywood life and, you know, go a different direction with her career. She had a lot of opportunities based off the fact that she won a Grammy. So there's a lot of doors open for her. Now, the locks, man. You'll start to see everybody start going their own way. But the locks, they they say, forget it, man. We're going to go even grittier. And I know everybody remember this this time period when they came up with D-Block. Now, D-Block was the locks record label where they had artists like Jay hood you know what I'm saying? And those cats were real, real ill mixtape artists. You know what I'm saying? They were on the mixtape scene. They were killing it. Like, Jay hood was, was, was an ill mixtape rapper, man. But it was more in a different direction. They were going away from the commercial to the point where they were just strictly street. They were strictly mixtape because I can't think of a D block joint that just was really, really successful commercially. But now that I think about it, there is an exception to that. Jada Kiss. Now, Jada Kiss during this time, even when they were repping D block, man, and during the last days of, you know, the Rough Rider having their grip on the game, he dropped Kiss of Death and he dropped The Last Kiss. Now, both of those, Kiss of Death, was strictly on Rough Rider Interscope and The Last Kiss was on Def Jam, D-Block, and Rough Riders. But collectively, the locks, they just wanted to do their own thing where they could be CEOs as well. They didn't want to always just be the artist and not be the one who get the fat end of the check. And they just wanted to make that transition. And man, you can't really blame them, especially with the way the record industry was at that time in a funky place because the record industry was dying and that played a large part in what's going to happen later. So during this time period, man, everybody starts to just go their own way, man. DMX is wilding out. He's getting in as much trouble as he is in movie roles. And dude is just going left, man. And his career is on a decline, which is sad to see because of the great talent that he has. But it's also, man, in collaboration with everybody's career going a different direction. Swiss Beats opens his own label, man. And he's trying to see what he can do as far as artists and put them out there. Now, what they do is clear up a funny story, man, from a, from a I've heard a couple of times, man, I've read, and it was always alleged that DMX was at the airport, and he was getting into it with somebody, man, and he jumped out of his vehicle and jumped into a car in front of the car he was getting into it with and allegedly told that guy, hey, man, I'm an FBI agent. I need to commandeer your car, man. <laughs> so you can see that X was wild, man. And he kind of touched on that on the Breakfast Club interview, and they show a little clip of that. But, man, I always thought that fu that story was funny. Now, things aren't looking good for Rough Riders, the label as a whole, because they haven't done a good job of bringing in new artists. During this whole time, all they focused on were their superstars, which are amazing acts. You're talking about Eve, DMX, The Locks. There's, you're talking about some of the greats. Even Drag On, man, it, who they don't talk about at all, man. They don't talk about Dragon much at all in this thing. He's not there to talk. I mean, what in the world's going on with the Dragon situation? Like, why aren't they talking about him? Dragon was a big artist on Rough Rider, man. 
he was on some of my favorite songs with Eve, man. He's, I don't I don't get why he's left out of the documentary, but man, there must be something going on there, you know? Now, they're talking about how they had to get a new acquisition. The A&Rs are tripping. They're like, man, you know, everybody else is Asian on our roster, and we need new X, man. That's how labels die, man. That's how Motown died. Yeah, kind of how Motown died. But that's how a lot of labels die. You know, they, they just can't, they don't, they don't have new X coming in that are successful as their old X. Now, they do a risky acquisition. They say, man, we sign in Jen. Now, for those of you who don't know, Jen was a freestyle champ on 106 in Park. Dude had mad skills on the mic. He's like a little Asian Eminem, man, a Chinese Eminem. And that's no diss, man. That's just a, giving him his props, you know, while drawing the comparison because he is Chinese. Now, dude was dope. He was a dope lyricist. But the crossover to Rough Riders is a tr tough transition because Rough Riders is seen as this rugged and hardcore label. And Jin, he just didn't exude that. He was dope at what he did, and he shouldn't have to change who he is. And they thought they could, you know, put him out there and push him without making him change his image. All right, and I'm, I'm going to have to keep it true with y'all, man. The whole Jin with Rough Rider thing, it just looked... It looked cringeworthy from the start. I don't know why. Even when he announced it on 106 and Park, when they took pictures, it just was not a good fit, man. So they work on Jen's album, man. man. I'm hoping that everybody's hoping at the time that it's a banger, right? So their deal with Interscope is dissolved, man. That deal is over. Their sweetheart deal is gone. So now they're looking for a new label. They take Jen over to Virgin, and they're having a problem marketing him. Now, everybody could understand this because he's with Rough Riders. He's an interesting figure. You know, you hear stories. Dr. Dre had the same issue with Eminem when he first signed Eminem. But, you know, Eminem found his way, obviously. And they figured Jim would find his way, obviously. But they were coming up with these cringeworthy marketing schemes like fortune cookies with his name on it. Man, you could not get away with that stuff today, man. People would, there would be some type of boycott or something, man. I, I can't even believe they tried that. But they tried it anyway, man. It just, it just didn't work, man. The album flopped. Okay, so now the record industry is on a decline, man. Record sales are plummeting. The whole industry is imploding because of direct sharing platforms like LimeWire and Napster and all that, man. And people don't have to go to the record store to buy albums anymore. And Rough Rider is one of those labels that has a joint venture with, with the bigger labels. And the bigger labels are starting to see the fact that, hey, man, we need to start getting rid of all these relationships. You can see it with... Def Jam and Rockefeller, Murder Inc., all those big labels where they had, you know, CEOs who were really hip hop heads that charged, man, they got rid of that whole formula, man. Because a lot of cats got fat and were eating off of that, man, and was able to make some big money. And Rough Riders are caught all up in that, but they are really feeling it because they have a huge team, man. They got their street team people, they got their stunt team people, they got a lot going on, man. They got their office people, man, and they're running the business. And they don't have any new successful acts. And the, the record industry is on a steadily decline. It's not even steady. It's just like a spike down, like boom. So, man, they are in a weird position and a horrible position as a business. And they got to start laying people off, man. The record labels, the major record labels, they start laying off the, the those labels that they have those imprint deals with. And it's like, forget this, man. We got, we got to trim the fat as well. Now, this is what I find interesting. Everybody was totally against this new technology when it came out and they couldn't see where it was going to go in the future because now today you know that streaming actually helped save the music industry because they got to cut out the middleman like the CD pressing and all that, all that hard material that you would have that you would have to hold or CDs would stay on the shelf and they'd have to reorder them and stuff. They cut that totally out of the budget. And streaming platforms that, that rose up later on, like Spotify, Apple Music, and all that, those things actually made the record industry more profitable in the future, which is crazy. It's a, it's a crazy fact, man, and interesting when you see what they are going through at this time. But why, man? He saw the writing on the wall, so he said, forget this, man. We're going to invest more in our lifestyle brand, in the clothing, the motorcycle clubs, and all that, man. So for a while, that was their focus. Now, when, when D gets better he wants to get back into the music man he wants he knows that that is where the money comes in from and that's what funds everything so he wants to do a new dmx project problem is a lot has changed in the industry man 
Now you've got L.A. Reid and Jay-Z over at Def Jam. Jay-Z took the role as the president, L.A. Reid as a, as, a, as a CEO. And, man, it's just a different program, you know. And DMX, he looks at Jay-Z as his equal, you know. He doesn't want to be dropping an album under, under Jay-Z. And plus, Jay-Z was not feeling anything they submitted. So he let them get a release, man, from Def Jam, and they took it on, on to another record label. So DNY, they leveraged a relationship that they had with Chad Elliott, who's a record executive now over at Sony Columbia Urban or something like that. And they get with DMX. They try to clean the album up a little bit because they got a lot betting on this. DMX drops the album, and it's not a flop, man. The first week it sells over 100,000 copies, but it's his first album not to go number one so that was the headline that they ran with in the media man which kind of kind of made it seem like a failure even though the album really wasn't man a hundred thousand out the gate that's still man that's still pretty good man but compared to his past projects you know they were going almost platinum the very first week like out the gate platinum certification you know and that's hard act to follow man and the industry had changed at this time, and it's 2006, and, you know, the fans are moving on. You got to realize, man, your fans that are going to be there when they're 18, man, they probably do want to listen to somebody different when they're 26. Uh, maybe not. Not in their case. I think your fans in that Def Jam era, they kind of moved with those artists, but they're still young enough to, they want to listen to the newer artists, too. Because at that time, you got a resurgence of Lil Wayne and Cash Money and those cats coming back up. And for me, in the background, 2006, 2007, when they were pushing this record for DMX and they were betting on it, the the industry changed a lot, yes. But something even bigger was happening. The South was gearing up for a complete takeover for a long time in the record industry. Like I said, Lil Wayne, I think he had just dropped the Carter II around that time or whatnot. It was really about to change, man. Things are about to change in a totally different direction. And we're, that's like only a year or two before Drake, if you think about it, man. So Drake was about to come and he's about to take over the industry for a whole decade solid. So it's it's a very interesting time, man. Yeah, and they, they trying to still push, man, that the same gritty East Coast hardcore bars, man. Like everything in the music industry, it's in waves, man. Things go in and out, man. So you, you got, like Master P said, it's like three years you got on top if you come with a new sound, new style. And some people get less than that. Think of kind of like Fetty Wap and, and folks like that, man. It could be just that quick, but it definitely goes in waves. Now, with the label in a bad spot, man, it gets so bad that why, man, he has to take out a second mortgage on his crib just in order to make sure that the operations at the office can continue and he can make sure people get their paychecks. But he has to eventually cut them off and say, hey, man, this is it. We close the shop. We're going to we go in another direction. We're going to move away, away from the music, man. Now, they say that Wad never officially closed down the operation for good. But, man, things have just, they, it, it's done, man. It's a done deal. They don't have no new artists. DMX is not as successful as they thought he would be. Things are just done, man. They don't have enough money coming in to pay people. It's, it's So it's kind of silently closed. They worry about going to their families, focusing on family, taking care of stuff. And they really don't reemerge until like 2017. So you're talking about almost a decade later. Now, they strike a deal with Live Nation to where they could do three East Coast tours. And I believe it was like New York, Boston and Philly or something like that. And if they do well on those, then they could do like a whole set of tour dates all across the country. Now, this is in 2017. And you start to see this thing of these nostalgia tours really, really becoming big. And, you know, it carried on until recently. You've seen that with a lot of other acts. And they're really doing well. But they've got such a huge fan base. And they got a foothold in so many cities. They know if they have a successful arena tour, that's going to bring in a lot of money. Especially with Live Nation sponsoring or hosting the event. So they have their first tour dates. And the thing is a success, man. Fans get to see DMX, Eve, The Locks back on stage again. And, you know, their label is able to sell a lot of merchandise and stuff like that. You know, the very first show is a very good sign of things to come. So they packed all three of the shows, man. And I guess it was in Atlantic City, Connecticut, and then the Barclays in Brooklyn. So, man, and if you guys remember, man, 
they had an interesting situation that happened at one of the shows where X had what they thought was a meltdown, but a lot of people said he was praying. Nobody ever thought about or went back to see what exactly went down in that situation. But I remember that mess vividly, man, when X was just, he was pouring his heart out on the stage, man. And that was one of the moments from the Rough Riders anniversary tour that, I, that most people still remember to this day. So they sell out all three shows. It is looking amazing, man. Even better than they thought. And DMX the next day gets locked up for tax evasion, man. Man, these cats can't win for losing in this situation, man. They just throwing roadblocks at them left and right. So they're forced to put the tour on ice, man. Later on in the future, they're going to try to put it together. But y'all know what happened currently, man. We got this whole COVID situation going on. And things have been on ice since they left the tour back there in 2017, man. So it's a crazy situation. But they're very positive about it, man. D and Y both were like, yo, man, you know, we, we, don't, we don't have regrets. It was great to even just come out for those three shows. And they're focusing on blowing up their kids as artists. And then there's a the time of reflection on the rest of the documentary. They talk about the good times that they had. They talk about how this experience with Rough Rider propelled them to heights they never thought they would reach and how it gave them careers. You know, these are kids who are from the streets. And it came together Two brothers with an idea, and it was an amazing adventure and an amazing journey. Now, this was a great docuseries. I loved every minute of it. I think it encapsulated everything I remember from the time of Rough Riders, and hopefully in the future, they get that tour and I'll get me a ticket, man. Now, with that, this has been your boy, Big Man, and we out of here. Peace. Oh, yeah, and please remember to like this video, man. Your boy putting in that work. And then also, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you can get them daily hip-hop updates. And we out of here. Peace.